Good morning. Uh, welcome uh, to the February 7th uh, Joint Authority and Canal uh, Board meeting. As always, uh, I'm pleased to have with me uh, my fellow trustees, Tracy McKibben, B. Gonzalez, Mike Balboni, Dennis uh, Trainer, uh, Tony Pacente is uh, unable to uh, join us today and is officially excused from class. As always, Justin and his uh, distinguished uh, team are with us uh, as well. And uh, I'm happy to call this meeting that has otherwise been duly noticed uh, per open meetings law to order. Uh, as always, start with an adoption of our uh, agenda, uh, which everyone has had uh, the opportunity to review. And unless there's uh, any changes or amendments there to it, ask for a motion to adopt. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion, uh, agenda and a motion uh, adopted. Uh, contractors list, uh, we've all been apprised uh, periodically of uh, any potential conflicts there. I'm assuming and asking if anyone has any late breaking conflicts we need to be made aware of. All right, um, as is uh, custom, we will uh, start uh, with uh, an executive uh, session pursuant to section 105 of the public officers uh, law. Our guesstimate is that we'll be at it for about an hour, plus or minus. Uh, so I'd ask for a motion to uh, adjourn to exec session. Michael, thank you. Second. Second, Tracy. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carried. Uh, and so we'll be back with you, uh, plus or minus an hour or so. Thank you. Aye. All right, welcome back, uh, everyone. Uh, if I could ask for a motion. Uh, to resume the meet, remaining, little, resume the meeting in open session. Second. Second. Moved. All in favor? Aye. We're back at it. All right. Uh, we've obviously got a full squad turnout at this point, so uh, welcome everyone if uh, you weren't with us earlier. It's our first uh, meeting of uh, 2023. Chatted with Justin a bit to ensure we uh, sharpen our focus as a board, uh, our priorities, our uh, strategy. Uh, risk management, risk oversight and uh, operations uh, want to ensure that as we navigate our agendas, uh, meeting in and meeting out, we don't lose sight of those priorities in that order. Uh, so you'll see an effort on our part today to ensure <laughs> we stay uh, a little more focused than at times we tend to drift and wander uh, uh, from time to time. So reset uh, as we uh, start a new year. Uh, Justin will kick us off, Joe Kessler, Adam, Ham and Agat, uh as well to cover that collective efforts. Eves uh, will bring us current and Eves over here uh, in uh, undercover. You doing okay? Yeah, I'm fine. Okay. Okay. Uh, and uh, have a good discussion uh, uh, from you know that perspective, strategy, risk, and, and, and ops, and then we'll wrap up with uh, some uh, committee reports. So, Justin, the floor is yours to kick us off. Well, good morning, Chairman, Trustees, NIPA colleagues, member of the members of the public. Uh, good to be with you here today in our first meeting of 2023. Uh, we we got together at the end of 2022 and did a little bit of a recap on uh, some of the successes that we achieved uh, during 2022, and now. You know, as we sit here today, um, fully underway in 2023, I think it's going to be a really exciting year for the Power Authority. Um, a lot going on, obviously, on the state level with um, the uh, state uh, scoping plan uh, being issued at the end of uh, the year. Uh, this is the document that sort of informs the DEC regulatory process that's now going to kick off as, as the state um, looks to execute on the Climate Act, uh, the CLCPA that was passed several years ago. So. We'll be we'll be fully engaged in that process and uh, and uh, informing and and watching it carefully and, and reporting to you along the way in terms of the DEC regulatory process that uh, that is about to uh, to unfold. So um, you know, as you'll hear from the team uh, to follow on to the message that uh, that you just uh, stated, Chairman. Uh, you know, we're 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 trying to tie it all together from a strategy and a risk and an operation standpoint. And uh, you know, you'll hear from. You'll hear from operations uh, as to some of the great work going on there. And, and uh, you'll hear certainly from our CFO, Adam Barsky, on the financial strength of the organization. I think we're really 
um, in a great position to uh, achieve and accelerate uh, progress in 2023. And, and then you'll hear a little bit about it, the customer uh, activities of the authority as well. So um, obviously our 2020, 2023 strategy is, uh, is it continues to be our North Star. So in that, in that vein, I um, wanted to talk to you about a few things that have been going on um, that further our um, our progress toward toward our Vision 2030 strategy. So, um, I've been out and about uh, in the uh, last couple of months, and uh, you'll see here um, I'm here with the uh, Lieutenant Governor Antonio Delgado up in Hancock, New York, which is uh, just off of Route 17. I was told it's the halfway point from uh, Long Island to uh, many uh, road trips, bringing kids back to college and the halfway point in Hancock where a lot of people stop either to go to the Roscoe Diner or to fuel up their car or whatever. But uh, uh, so this is a very interesting project in that um, and it was very surprising to the people at Hancock. There's a, a, a several, several local residents that attended. And uh, um, when I told them that it was the second largest charging station next to JFK airport, they said, what? In, in Hancock, New York, we could the be the second, lar <laughs> second largest in the New York state, but it consists of um, eight NIPA chargers and eight Tesla chargers lined up in one location. So, um, you know, we, we looked around and, and it, really, it really is what the future is going to look like. And, and it was um, well received in Hancock uh, to kick that off with the, uh, with the LG. Um, Moving on. Um, I think in the press releases, I saw that. I think there was a quote for each charger. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We met the, the uh, you know how you get the, uh, obviously you get the local, uh, you know, supervisor and-, and, uh, uh, and They're all quoted. And, yeah. and it's actually, we actually had, a. Uh, it's next to a dog park. They put a dog park in alongside the charger. So if you're traveling with a dog, I guess you take your dog out, you walk around the, the dog park. So we had an actual dog owner as part of the uh event. <laughs> he or she get quoted in the release <laughs> uh spoke right so she spoke uh so yeah it was uh it's good good stuff there uh next carly if you go to the next slide um so this um this was also exciting this is um something that i think you're aware of we did an innovation challenge out in um in in, uh, in 2019 i believe where we were looking for a partner to do a demonstration project at the University of Buffalo. And I think there were 108 applicants in this innovation challenge that we ran and this company won. And so the demonstration project is using a, uh, a type of battery storage technology, zinc technology is an alternative to lithium, lithium iron battery technology. Um, doesn't present a lot of the mineral issues involving uh, battery, lithium ion battery technology that, that, we, that the industry faces. So um, we started working with them on this project at UB and uh, it's uh, designed you know, to, to actually to provide storage for the uh, campus. But um, the nice thing about it was that in our interactions with them, we started dealing, they started dealing more with New York State and uh, ultimately through various incentives uh, that the state provided, they, they decided to move their uh, US headquarters to New York State. So they're gonna be located uh, in Kingston. And I think um, the, job, job, uh, the job numbers were, were pretty substantial. Um, uh, $68 million and uh, up to 500 uh, clean, energy, clean energy jobs in Kingston. So really great event there. Um, next, Carly, if you could go to the next slide. This is this you'll see me here, sort of poorly positioned and uh, height <laughs> and, uh, height, and challenged. And height challenged. Uh, I got a tall guy I in gotta front do, of you. You got to. I got to do something. I got to get better at that. Maybe sharper elbows or get up there. Bring a stool. Or something. Bring at least bring a step stool. Yeah. Joe, so, don't you have a step stool in the car all the time? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I'm gonna. I, I promise to get better at that and try to get up toward the. Front. We used to talk to Gil about that, you know, at least have a phone book or something, you know, Andy? I was straining there, wasn't I? Uh, so anyway, anyway, this was, uh, you know, we've done some work with Plug Power previously um, out in, uh, Chairman, I think you, you joined us uh, out in the Batavia area, Alabama, New York, uh, to kick off their plant there um, at the stamp facility. And this is, um, this is a really impressive facility just outside of Albany that they're 
um, that they're building. I think it went up in less than a year, believe it or not. And uh, it's supported by a recharge um, uh, allocation from us that you approved back in, uh, back in March of 2022. Um, and you know, they're, they're very active in the fuel cell uh, technology, both for, I think they started out serving you know, the, the uh, um, Amazons and others uh, in terms of their forklifts. Uh, trucks and so forth, but it's gone well beyond that. Now, of course, fuel cells are going to be a big part of the transition here, whether it's with respect to transportation and, uh, you know, uh, medium duty uh, trucks and so forth. But uh, they're, they're going to be a big part of the transition. And the, the state is happy to have them have such a big footprint here in New York State. Um, next, Carly, if you go to the next. Uh, uh, item. Uh, so this this is uh, something we talked to you about previously. This came out of last year's State of the State, where uh, NYPU was designated to work with um, uh, firehouses uh, to provide better resiliency at uh, firehouses in uh, New York City. And so um, we announced the completion of uh, some solar roofing installations at six FD, FDNY firehouses in uh, in Brooklyn and Queens uh, to provide better resiliency uh, around these critical services. So we're happy to sort of follow through and see execution on some of the promises and uh, commitments that we made last year in the uh, in the state of the state. And then uh, if you go to the next slide, Carly. And then finally, um, wanted to just highlight some of the great work that Lisa Wansley and her team have been doing. This is um, an event that we held for our scholarship recipients. As you know, we've, we've um, come to you uh, and you've met some of the uh, some of the um, great students that we've um, been able to support through these programs. So we had an event uh, for them called our Future Energy Leader Scholarship Summit, hosting the 21, 2021 and 2022 uh, scholarship classes here uh, in the White Plains office. So I think we're, um, we're, as I say, we're really well positioned to kick off 2023 here. I think it's going to be a great year for us. Um, before I turn it over to Eve to talk a little bit more about some specifics around the 2020, uh, 2030 strategy, uh, I'd be happy to take any questions from, from the board. Well, we want to share your views between the governor's uh, budget announcements and in fact, you want to you know, talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, as, as you probably saw, the, um, the governor's budget included a provision uh, that would expand um, authority to the power authority to um, to uh, get more involved in the actual uh, generation side of uh, renewable generation. And uh, there's been obviously other proposals that have been before the legislature. And so uh, the budget process will now kick off and we'll, we'll be obviously a full participant uh, in the discussions around, um, around this potential expansion of our authority. But um, we're obviously you know, excited to be able to play uh, an additional role and lean in more. Um, and so we're, um, we'll, we'll certainly stay close to it and keep you informed as to the uh, developments as the legislative process kicks off here. And how that aligns, otherwise aligns with our you know, strategic vision. Yeah, well, so, I mean, you know, in terms of where we sit today, um, obviously, we, you know, to the extent that uh, we wanna make sure that the state achieves its goals and accelerates its progress toward the goals. So anything that we can do at the power authority to contribute to that, of course, we wanna do it also, uh, builds nicely on the uh, pillar of our um, or strategy, a foundational pillar of our strategy around decarbonization of our customers, sort of helping them, uh, helping them uh, achieve their decarbonization goals. So, one of the things that that has been a game changer for the pub public power sector is this uh, direct the direct pay provision that was included in the uh, Inflation Reduction Act that. Um, uh, would enable NIPA to play a, 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 a maybe a different and more impactful role on behalf of our customers uh, as, as they look to build out their own uh, renewable uh, portfolios. So uh, excited to be able to kind of build in that new um, that new assistance that that we'll be able to receive from the federal government that previously we wouldn't be able to get because we were a tax exempt uh, entity. Anything else as you stand here on February 7th, uh, obviously, as we plan the year 90, 120 days ago, 100 days ago, uh, now that it's off and running and we're 37 days into it, um, as you look ahead from the top of the organization, um, anything else you 
you know, that keeps you up at night or that you're incrementally focused on in light of where we find ourselves mm -hmm. today versus what we anticipated to see uh, as we planned uh, for the year. Yeah, I think I think one of the things that I think about a lot is just in terms of the team and talent here. And, you know, we're the energy sector uh, is hot and uh, we're all competing for talent in the energy space. And NIPA, we've been fortunate that NIPA is perceived uh, and is, you know, an entity that's on the leading edge of the energy transition. So we've got to continue to um, make the case for why we're why we're um, a good place to work, why we're why we're leading. Uh, well, we're a great place to work. Oh, OK. Or that's it. Okay. <laughs> uh, but just, just I think you know, making sure that we continue to compete for talent, uh, attract, attract and retain talent, uh, because we're going to be, we, we continue to be asked to do more, and so we're going to need to have the, have, have the, the horses have, to have the horse. race. Yep. Team Tracy, B, Michael, Dennis. All right. Thank you. Okay. Now, so Eve. Uh, Are you protecting yourself against from us, or are we pr you protecting your, us from you? I am um, showing love for my fellow New Yorkers oh, by uh, right. taking care of everyone. Excellent. But I will take off the mask for the presentation. Okay. So, good morning, morning. trustees, colleagues, all of New Yorkers watching at home. My name is Eve Noel, and I'm the SVP of strategy for the New York Power Authority. With the conclusion of 2022, I'm here to provide an update on Vision 2030. In NIPA's previous trustee meetings, and also in Justin's comments earlier today, um, and other members of the team have provided updates to Vision 2030 and accomplishments throughout the year, real-time accomplishments. What I'm here to do today is to bring together those real-time accomplishments and show from a, the strategic outlook and benefits that are, um, that are a result of those accomplishments. In the following slides, I'll highlight actions last year that benefited New Yorkers in 2022 and also will benefit New Yorkers in the years to come. Let me begin by stating plainly, in 2022, NIPA made significant progress against our mission and, and achieved many of the goals that were set out. The road is not easy, but we, but we as an organization are fully committed to accomplishing our objectives. Um, on the next slide, I, I begin with a discussion of just Vision 2030. Vision 2030, as you can see, is our plan to execute our chosen mission to lead the transition to a carbon-free, economically vibrant New York. Our strategy is framed around five challenges and, that, um, and in facing these challenges, that we benefit all New Yorkers. For example, in preserving the value of hydro power, we provide the necessary foundation for 70% renewable generation by 2030. In order to have 100% emissions-free generation by 2040, we need to decarbonize um, the generation for the state and connect renewables through well-planned transmission projects. At its center, NIPA exists to partner with the people of New York to meet their energy goals, including Local Law 97, CLCPA, and other sustainability goals. Additionally, NIPA continues, um, contributes to the resiliency of the state through programs benefiting canal communities and all New Yorkers. Next slide, please. In generation, we supply affordable, clean, and reliable electricity. Last year, we generated 22 terawatt hours of emissions-free electricity from our hydropower facilities. To ensure that we can continue to provide hydropower into the future, we, we shared our insights and analysis on support mechanisms with key stakeholders. With our gas plants, we met our GHG emissions intensity targets in 2022. In a major step towards decarbonizing the Southeast New York fleet by 2035, we issued the CINI storage RFP. This RFP focused on potential use of our small clean power plant sites and related electric infrastructure for the development of bulk storage battery storage projects. This was an open procurement 
which contrib contributes to New York's goal of serving and integrating intermittent offshore wind projects um, onto the grid. Let's transition to transmission. Our next slide, please. As a public authority, NYPA serves New Yorkers by bringing clean, reliable energy to where it's needed most, and by creating transmission solutions that contribute to the overall um, strength of the state. To support the state's grid in 2022, we added a significant amount of transmission assets, over 270 million to meet our goal, our year-end goal of 1.5 billion. Also in 2022, major construction has progressed on Central East Energy Connect, Smart Path, Smart Path Connect, Y49, and the TLEM program. This work will continue in 2023, along with progress on Clean Path. NIPA's transmission, is commit, NIPA's transmission organization is committed to helping protect uh, the health and safety and security of New Yorkers by supporting the energy transmission. Next slide. In conclusion, I look to the direct impact that we've had in the lives of New Yorkers. To name a few, NIPA has performed energy efficiency projects that reduced or removed 23,000 tons of greenhouse gases in 2022. As part of NYPA's commitment to communities, NYPA's economic development activities resulted in 32 billion in capital invested and 441,000 jobs created or retained last year. Additionally, NYPA launched the third season of On Canals Excursions. This offers a unique opportunities to experience the waterways of the canal system and the Empire State Trail. As we look to the future, NIPA, along with NYCHA and ACERTA, are at tackling one of the hardest markets for the energy transition. The heating and cooling of needs of existing multifamily buildings to hasten the transition to fossil fuel heating sources. As you may recall, the NIPA board awarded funding through two contracts for the development and delivery of cold climate package window heat pump units. The award was part of the Clean Heat for All Challenge to develop and produce 30,000 heat pump units for the benefit of NYCHA residents. NYPA has done all of this and more, and also was recently recognized as a top quartile performer in customer satisfaction by JD Powers. In conclusion, 2022 was a productive year for NYPA. We are accelerating um, to hit our goals and we continue to lead the transition to an economically vibrant New York. I'll take any questions. Yeah. Go ahead, Drake. Yeah, oh, oh, right um, you know, as I think about, you know, how NYPA has captured their mission and it seems to me there are three key areas that we always focus on and you went through than today. Your mic Sorry about that. Um, the focus on the customer, right? Yep. Um, focusing on, you know, electricity, whether that's from the perspective of decarbonization of natural gas, the work that we're doing around um, charging stations and supporting uh, additional renewable energy um, on the grid, as well as innovation. Yep. Um, I, I'd like your thoughts into Justin's point that he made earlier about energy being hot, and I'd say energy transition is really hot. How do you think about as we, you know, left 2022 going into 23 from a strategic perspective, our approach and being able to continue to be a leader in this space for the for the state? Um, you know, I just like your thoughts on, you know, what are the adjustments that we you think we need to be making going forward? that we learned from 2022 with the challenges both in the market as well as the ability to deliver what we say we wanna deliver and all the new competition coming into energy transition. Um, just your general thoughts on that. No, I appreciate the question. I think to start with, I think 2022 proved to us that we have, our strategy has been validated by the market. I think the world is on a decarbonization journey and we have chosen to lead that. I think going forward, what 2022 also taught us is we're not immune to macroeconomic factors, high inflation, the war, um, 
the um, results of COVID. They're all factors that play, um, that have impacted our strategy and will continue to impact our strategy in the future. So I think like the, the, the key here is as Justin alluded, innovation, right? We need to be a nimble organization that recognizes what's occurring in the market and be able to pivot so that we bet most, so that we still hit our goals, but are do that in the most um, efficient manner of getting there. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. But what do we need to do to better pivot? Yeah. Because I agree, life's a game of pivots. Yeah. You know, we're, we're forever having to, you know, evolve at a minimum. So we're 20, pushing 25% of our way through this, uh, you know, 10-year run here. Um, what, what more do we need to do to pivot, to accelerate, to better enable the successes uh, you and Tracy just referenced? Sure. When I look at across the board, I think that we've made modifications and pivots in all in each of the five challenges that we talk about. Within hydropower, we're really looking at um, how our small hydro units can be better positioned for the future to come. When I look at transmission, I think that like we're doing, we're doing an excellent job of meeting our goals around accomplishing transmission, about getting transmission projects and to, for the benefit of the state. I think what we can do within transmission, I know John and Phil have all been working on integrating more of an equity component to the work that we're doing there. When I think about um, decarbonizing our, our customers, I think that as we all know that there's been sort of significant challenges from these macroeconomic um, factors. I mean, inflation is on everyone's sort of mind and we're looking at different ways to, to, to bring projects um, projects to customers in a manner that they can sort of afford. And then finally, when I think about Reimagine the Canal, Reimagine the Canal last year had the biggest pivot of all, right? We really we were adjusting our strategy all um, throughout. And I think, um, so going forward, we need to keep the same mindset around thinking about, hey, like what, what let's try projects these projects aren't working out, how do we pivot and change those projects in order to get our ultimate goal, which is economic development for the canal communities? Okay. Um, you know, Justin, team, he, in terms of our resource alignment, uh, you're uncomfortable that our resources all in, you talked about team and talent, whether it be financial, whether it uh, just, you know, other resources that our alignment uh, is where it needs to be. You, right amount as well as uh, the right focus to ensure you know efficient and effective execution i think we're uh, i think we're we're well aligned um to to um you know as we kick off the year to to uh, you know continue to push the strategy i think we're always you know we're constantly looking at it obviously you know if if we get new authority uh from the legislature that's going to cause us to i think you know, take a look at our staffing and see uh, see where we sit. Uh, you know, at that moment in time, given you know, depending upon the extent of the new authority that we that we receive from the legislature. But I think that would be one thing that we have to stay focused on this year is uh, is that. And I think you know, on the customer side, the customers' needs are rapidly changing. Uh, they're becoming more and more sophisticated. So you know, we have to always be mindful of whether we're dedicating enough resources to those to that customer journey. Other questions? Pete, Michael, Dennis? Okay, thanks very much. You appreciate Thank the you. recap. Yep. All right, uh, next up, uh, Joe on the operation side. Transmission generation. Just checking my watch, Sam. Still, still saying good morning. So good morning, uh, Chairman <laughs> and trustees. Um, and uh, uh, staff and uh, are you on point schedule or what? You're checking your watch. No, I just want to just want to make sure I'm wishing oh, you still okay. a good morning right. versus good afternoon. So I wish you a good afternoon too later. Okay. Um, <laughs> we'll still be at it. <laughs> That's right. We might still be at yeah, it. We'll I might still be, still be standing here. Yeah. Well, um, see, so. how you do, see how it goes, Joe. You know? <laughs> yeah. Um, next slide, please, Carla. I'll go right to it. Uh, I just want to introduce a couple of concepts that the, the operating team is really looking at uh, going forward here. Um, and give you a brief update on uh, where we are in uh, Niagara as well, on Next Gen Niagara. Obviously, a significant investment there. Uh, but you're going to hear this acronym HPI going forward. It's really a, a human performance initiative. That's a little redundant on the slide initiative, initiative there. But um, it's really a, an initiative we're taking on in collaboration with APRI, Electric Power Research Institute, 
Um, with a focus originally, I think, in inspiration around uh, safety, some of the issues we had safety-wise uh, last year, but it really is beyond that. It's really around operational performance and where the human actually has some interface and some decision-making in the process. And, uh, you know, Justin talked about our, our concerns around uh, retaining and recruiting personnel. I think, you know, focus on safety, not only from a physical standpoint, but the psychological safety to own up to things as well and, and to, to learn from things and be a learning organization is going to be a big part of what our strategy is going forward. And this initiative will support that. So the idea here is that there's really four tools that we're emphasizing around uh, having a questioning attitude. Um, effective communications, for example, three-part communications and an operating procedure. Uh, so it's not necessarily a safety issue, but make sure you're, sure you're hitting the right switch um, as you're doing that. Um, stopping when you're unsure. Uh, that is obviously more geared towards safety, but we've had a few incidents uh, that, you know, we wonder if people are feeling under the pressure of, of getting things done and just not taking the time when they're, uh, you know, I call it the spidey sense, um, you know, buzzes a little bit, uh, you know, should we stop here and have people be comfortable that, you know, schedule and, and budget is not everything. It's really about your safety as well. And uh, just self-checking, you know, one of the things that, uh, as a, you know, I, I consider us a learning organization. I think one of the things that we, we need to do better is re recapping what has happened, taking those lessons learned and have people come forth and have some culpability um, if there was a bad decision. Because I think in large part, when we do these kinds of reviews, what we learn is the process is broken. It's not the people. Uh, so we want to make sure that uh, uh, we're covering all bases when we do that. So our goal is to roll this out with that immediately. Actually, we're doing some training right now with the senior management level. Uh, we are going to get the uh, in the second quarter some additional training going on and kickoff officially where we're starting to incorporate some of these practices in, in processes and, and procedures uh, by the third quarter of this year. So I just wanted you to be familiar with this uh, acronym because you may be hearing more about that going forward. Next slide, please, Carly. Uh, as we touched on in the, uh, the earlier secure uh, committee meeting. Uh, there was some discussion about some of the recent events in substations uh, in the Pacific Northwest and in the South uh, Southeast. Uh, I just wanted to just, uh, I don't want to do anything redundant here, but I want to just assure the board that we are looking at this uh, from an operational standpoint in a couple different ways. First of all, we immediately elevated our posture uh, in response to some of those things and stayed in touch with uh, key stakeholders of the federal government and locally, including the state police and the Department of Energy and others. Uh, to make sure that we understood uh, at least early on what we thought the risks were, um, what the uh, causes were, and that we were postured in the right way uh, with our staff and with our with our uh, monitoring. So we feel we are in a good position right now, uh, given what we know in collaboration with those local agencies. Um, we are also getting briefings at a higher level from uh, agencies like the FBI and, uh, like I said earlier, the uh, FERC Dam Safety and Department of Energy. Um, we're also being... Uh, uh, supported very significantly by our New York State Police uh, in terms of additional rounds in, in some of the remote areas of our substations as well. But most importantly, what we're taking is the, uh, the forward-looking view that from an engineering standpoint, designing any new assets uh, with these things in mind to make sure that we're mitigating those and keeping an eye on what future threats might be. So we have some uh, technologies that we put in place. You see here a mobile surveillance unit. Uh, we'll be rotating this unit around different substations to, to show our um, uh, presence in, from a security standpoint, and they are very effective. We actually used these units on the canal system a few years ago and kind of did some test and learn there and found out they're very effective and immediately, um, you know, showing uh, where high exposed areas are and where we can react and have uh, monitoring capabilities. Uh, we also set up a cross-functional team, probably the most important aspect of this, uh, where we are going to look at not only engineering designs, but all, all different uh, uh, aspects of physical security, including up restoration at the end of it because as Larry pointed out in the public session of this secure meeting some of these inevitabilities uh, you know we can't protect from everything so we have to have a good posture around spare parts um, you know recovery software all kinds of different uh, avenues and uh, this cross-functional team uh, within the the, uh, the power authorities uh, designed to to cover all those bases and plan that forward next slide please Carly and I just wanted to give a brief update. We're very excited that you know we're making making moves on the next gen Niagara. We announced the 1.1 billion dollar initiative in Niagara uh, a couple of years ago, I guess already, and um, we're underway already. Um, so we have the uh, the uh, operators in uh, Niagara now have a renewed uh, control room. We welcome visitors to kind of take a look at it, and you'll know, be happy to host uh, folks in that. Um, all of this is really just to, again kind of to, uh, geared toward that digitalization digitalization, um, the um, 
um, making sure that the, you know, the, the operators have the best visibility. We used a lot of uh, uh, con consultants to make sure that, you know, in terms of alarms and masking things, that everything is more, the operators are more aware and have more um, sophistication in what they're doing for situational awareness. And that uh, um, we're having flexibility to grow um, certain capabilities if we need to in those areas. Um, and uh, again, with all this digitiz digitalization um, and communication, what we hope to do is obviously uh, just uh, maintain a higher level of reliability of our assets by having that visibility even transmitted back here to our integrated smart operating center. Um, to learn and use data analytics, AI, ML, uh, machine learning, and artificial intelligence going forward to even be more predictive about what we're doing. And this, this is the first step. Um, so we have uh, uh, some success and we're making, uh, uh, usually when we do these projects, there's 13 units at, Ni at Niagara at the, at the lower um, plant, the Robert Moses plant. So you have to do some of the broader systems first before you get into each one of those individual units. And this is the first step that uh, uh, you know shows some progress this year. And I believe that uh, ends my presentation and be welcome any questions you may have on any of those or, or other issues. Um, let's pull back here a little bit. So what's success, you know, operationally in 23? What's your, what scorecard are you working with, working from your KPIs, your key drivers? Uh, what, are, what are you focused on? What are, what is, are you and your team? Uh, just managing to and, and, and leading for? Yeah, I think uh, the, primarily a lot of the things that, that Eve touched on. So for example, um, you know, where we focus, we're largely a hydro, today we're largely a hydro organization, right? So we think about the value of our hydro. So success in, in 23 is not only optimizing the uh, 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 cost that it takes, it, it takes to operate those units um, through these technologies and other things, but working with external stakeholders and, and um, public and regulatory affairs to, to understand the value. And, and really when we're communicating that to the uh, external agencies, sometimes it's a challenge because we have a difficult time quantifying uh, if you change our operating paradigm, what does that mean to our asset base? So with this digitalization, uh, what we're hoping is, is that we can better uh, remunerate that so that we can explain to them, if you're gonna run us in a certain way, there are some value to the system for that. And we expect that uh, we're, we'll come up with mechanisms or suggest mechanisms to be compensated for that. So our focus is to continue down this path on digitalization. On the small hydro side, we wanna look at, we wanna get more sophisticated at looking at each asset, each generating asset from a PL perspective, making sure that each one is successful. In aggregate, our portfolio is very successful financially, uh, but we have some that are struggling and some that are, are more successful. And we wanna make sure that we're, um, taking a hard look at what we're investing in those assets as well. So there's going to be some teams put together to focus on small hydro. And of course, the decarbonization strategy based on that RFP, we're just hoping to react on, on whatever those suggestions come out um, and what those plans are and uh, do that as well. We also are going to continue to support Phil's area and transmission because uh, that is creating, in some cases, the notion that there's going to be additional asset base for the New York Power Authority. We're actually seeing it in business development in terms of like the stamp development, for example. But as there's interconnections for offshore wind and, and large scale renewable and some of these other transmission asset bases, uh, we're going to have additional assets to monitor there too. So what our involvement in the O&M of those assets and compliance of those assets going forward is something that we're going to work closely with Phil's team on. So success will be what in 23? What's the, give me the scorecard, you know, parameters there for you and your team. There. So it would be, it would be successfully the, 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 uh, the implementation of those uh, capital programs that are supporting that is the way I'm looking at. It. So meeting our budget and schedule compliance on all those digitalization efforts um, and everything in support of, uh, of the team there. And what are the biggest Safely. challenges, obstacles you have to overcome? Justin, you know, talked about That's, Team and town. Top of mind. Top of mind is what Justin talked about. We are, especially in some key, significantly areas are around system planning. Um, everybody's doing it. You know, and now it used to be utilities were doing it, but now developers are doing it. Uh, the New York ISO is doing it. There are other entities that are consistently trying to look for system planners and technical analysis. Um, that's an area that we have high level of competency. Um, we are hanging on to those folks, but we have a lot of uh, turnaround and a lot of turnover in that area. So that's probably the number one area. Um, and also uh, retraining and upskilling all of our staff um, from the, the, the uh, IBW on up uh, around the digitalization effort. So we're going to be working closely with them now that we're in IBW's case. We're on, we already have a collective bargaining agreement in place. We're going to continue to have dialogue with them on how to upskill and, and best utilize that staff. And what about from the customer standpoint? Obviously, 
uh, incremental focus, continuing focus on leading with the customer, connecting with the customer, yeah. enabling their success. Uh, you know, talk a bit about you know that dynamic and where that element of our business continues to evolve where it needs to go. All right. You know, we're seen as a as a subject matter expert to our customers. So I think we're we're really trying to concentrate our, our customers. There's a few things that we do that are have been very successful around some of the broader strategies around, say, for example, street lighting or even implementation of some of the battery um, chargers for transportation. And that will scale up. But there are a lot of people doing those kinds of things where we see our value for our customers and what we're, we're hearing from our customers is there's other scenarios that are a little bit more complicated around what they might want to do in terms of their, their energy portfolio. And we're trying to develop products um, in support of that in terms of energy products. And we're also trying to uh, uh, work with them as from a technical perspective to make sure they understand, you know, if they're getting into something, for example, behind the meter um, energy and or storage, or if there's other interconnection things, uh, what, what we can offer in terms of expertise to support them. And I guess last thing I'm thinking of canals, I mean, canals rolls up the operations, right. you know, continuing as you know, it's been mentioned already today, talked a little <coughs> bit about from your perspective, what you see happening there, what's critical to success in 23 challenges, you know, if any. Yeah. So and, and from a canals perspective, I think the most important thing is we've become um, more, more aware of, of the different stakeholders and what they they contribute to the canal system. So there's a lot of different ways of looking at the canal system. In the last two years, under some uh, change in leadership at canals, we've come to understand them significantly better. So we're gonna adjust our, and really almost combine our efforts with reimagine and what we were gonna do from a capital and, and O&M per, uh, perspective in canals to make sure that what we're doing to not only, um, and the way I think of this is like licensing of a, a power project that some of the reimagined work is things that we have to do to make sure that stakeholders are, are satisfied and adequately taken care of and to make sure we can do the things we need to do in terms of making sure the water in the canal stays in, in the canal and some of those uh, resilience issues associated with that in terms of flood mitigation and, and other uh, protections for the communities. Dean, thoughts, questions for Joe? No, good question. Good report. Thank you. Yeah, anything else as you stand there? I mean, obviously, coming out of Western Europe, we ended last year, started this one with a blizzard. We've got a <laughs> quote unquote earthquake yesterday. Uh, it was 50 degrees below zero in Messina last weekend. I mean, the challenges, any new challenges? Just, you know, as you say that, um, Chairman, off, off, off the, off the, just off the top of my head, just as you're, as you're saying that it, there, what I learned about, um, you know, Western New York, I'm a Western New Yorker. I think many people know that, but um, but our employees in general is how resilient they are. But we do have to start, you know, I think we have to be a little bit better about paying attention to those employees in situations like that and communicating directly with them and what's going on. So I think that, again, that psychological safety of people to know that they're on top of mind for us when these issues happen. It's been incredibly challenging 22 into 23 in Western New York, as many people know, they've had the, uh, the shooting at Tops um, markets. Um, we've had seven feet of snow in November. We had a blizzard in uh, December and we had a minor earthquake. Uh, you know, what, when, you, when you say a minor earthquake is like the least of your concerns of all the things that happened last year, I think that's a, uh, you know, a tough year. So a lot of things have happened, but um, you know, I spend some time at the Buffalo office in Niagara and all the upstate facilities on occasion. And it's it's just good to be in touch with them to know that we're thinking about them. And I think we've done a good job uh, and can definitely do better in making sure that they have the psychological uh, safety to reach out when they have, uh, you know, stress and strain from these issues. Very good. I agree with that. That's important. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, so, Joe. Appreciate thank you. it very much. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Adam, Adam, uh, as we're still wrapping up uh, 22, uh, the floor is yours. Sure. Good morning. It's still good morning. Trustees, uh, NIPA colleagues, members of the public uh, participating. Um, go to the next slide. <clears throat> as we updated in the uh, Finance Committee, uh, these are still unaudited numbers, but uh, we're still on track to have a, uh, what I call a very good year. 12 plus zero. I've never seen it presented yeah. that way. Very nice. Okay. <laughs> Equals 12. Oh, okay. <laughs> we actually have a 13. There's actually a 13 period, which is part of that audit close. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, as I mentioned, all the trends, you know, uh, what I would say is that the, you know, the year was good overall. 
uh, obviously, but somewhat anomalous based on spike in energy prices, most likely you know, ex exasperated by the events in the Ukraine. Um, these are starting to abate significantly, and I'll, I'll, I'll point some out what's going on in the markets. Um, but overall, very good year, strong on transmission revenues, uh, generation revenues, expenses, uh, regular operating expenses remained very uh, tight on budget. Uh, some slight variances of four and a half percent over uh, the budget for some unexpected uh, expenses that arose weren't previously planned for. And um, the major item here is really the monetized funds, uh, which were 75 million, 63 million over budget. But as I've mentioned uh, to the trustees uh, earlier, I don't view that as an expense. I, I look at that as a dividend payment into the regions uh, where. Uh, we have economic development programs like Northern New York, Western New York. Uh, this money got, that's generated above a tariff rate uh, that we would otherwise receive uh, gets accumulated into these funds. And then those funds are distributed into the communities based on recommendations from local boards for economic uh, development projects that will come back to the board for approval uh, to be released as time goes on. So we see um, that as, a, as actually a positive uh, outcome of of all of this, just but, more money for us to be able to give to the communities yes, in which we operate. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. So, if there's no other questions on on this slide, we'll move on. Um, just also on, on the capital and called non-recurring O&M slide. The, the big takeaway here is is that as Joe is mentioning about delivering on projects and achieving capital plan uh, targets, you know, in the I would say five year, ten year average, typically it was around seventy five percent achievement of the plan. Uh, this past year, we did 88%, which is a significant improvement and an improvement on prior years. So each year, it's gotten better, um, which shows that we're accomplishing things. Uh, certainly in the utility operations area, some of the areas uh, didn't do as, as well, but we've discussed some of those uh, in the past as, in terms of um, you know, some, some of the programs like um, the EVs and so others that have had some um, delays based on supply chain issues and other issues. So uh, we hope that those will also accelerate over time. On the non-recurring O&M side, nothing major to really report there other than coming in under plan, which just means that um, some projects did not accelerate at all or as it planned, but also we didn't have many unexpected um, emergent issues at our facilities as well. So nothing you know, major other than that to report there. Any questions on that before I, we go to the next slide? I do. Slide? I just want to, you know, I think you've sort of touched on it a little bit, sort of the looking at the budget going forward for 23 compared to where we were, you know, our plan in 22 and some of the areas where we are, you know, the budget is less. Um, and I want to make sure that's not reflecting our desire to be ambitious about how we do some of the things, especially under commercial operations and energy services, where we haven't seen the kind of progress that we had hoped um, uh, or performance, I should, I guess I should say that we had hoped. And so, you know, making sure that we're, again, continuing to be ambitious and innovative in our thinking about how we deliver those services to our customers and continue to help them on their decarbonization and electrification journey. So, you know, as a budget, as a reflection of what those ambitions are, ambitions are I just want to make sure that there isn't a concern there about, you know, that we think we can, we, will be able to better deliver this year compared to what we were last year, even yep. with the challenges sure. that we had last year. Yeah, and I, and I think we will. Um, a lot's being done there. Joe's mentioned uh, he's done a lot of reorganization within his group to ensure that there's um, more resources towards project delivery and making sure that that's there, but also just in terms of engaging with our customers. Um, we have some big projects coming our way uh, particularly with the MTA and some of the other um, transit hubs around the state in terms of helping them electrify their um, bus fleet, for example, uh, the charging work that's being done at airports and other things like that. So in terms of our customers, we have a lot of um, major projects underway, which we see a lot of traction happening on. Good. Okay. Is your concern that this doesn't reflect? Yeah, enough? I just want to make sure that we're not pulling back because no. we weren't, you know, we didn't meet what we were hoping to do last year. Um, and so the budget is now reduced. So is that, you know. Um... Well, the budget, I mean, this is actually the, the actual spends against the plan. 
No, so, no, so, I get that. Yeah, I get yeah. the actual. No, I'm yeah. talking about looking at what the 23 sure. budget was compared to what the plan was, and just sure. making sure that again, I want us to be ambitious in these areas. We've laid out a number yep, absolutely. because we can make a difference in our in our positioning, right? And so, just making sure the team has the right um, ambitious goals set for delivery. Absolutely. Thank you. In areas where we've been challenged over the last year. Absolutely. Other Great. questions? We'll go with next slide. Just turning over to risk, summarizing some of the things that were done at the risk committee, but just from a higher level, just in terms of where the group is going. Uh, as you know, we did the maturity schedule. We achieved our goals to exceed industry benchmarks and even our own uh, target. Last year, we identified certain areas that were still lagging and we're, we have a plan to close that gap and exceed industry standards there. And as well as we have an ambitious goal to raise that maturity level there as well. And just in terms of things that they're doing, um, integrating with uh, controls, the internal controls group, internal audit risk, all being aligned and sharing information and coming around the whole issue of controls and risk and culture throughout the organization. Um, further development of the REGRC tool in which all of those groups will be having inputs and reports from and monitoring elevated risks that continues to get uh, advanced and developed and just you know also just making sure there's the, the right kind of metrics and reporting out to identify any emergent uh, issues uh, in terms of ensuring regulatory compliance it was one of the issues where we saw not an issue in terms of how we regulate how we monitor regulatory compliance in the organization but how is it all aggregated into one place over a um, uh, oversight committee that has eyes across the organization on all regulatory and compliance issues that has now been incorporated and being done so that there's a good view from throughout the organization to all the senior leadership of what's going on in the regulatory compliance space. So lots of good progress uh, being made there. We did give a highlight of where we're going to topics we'll cover with the, with the, uh, the risk committee in the uh, months ahead. Next slide. Just one question no. on this. Is this a self-assessment? Because obviously we've exceeded <laughs> industry benchmark, or is this an independent third it's, party who? So it, it, it's us? so it is based on a scoring matrix that okay. we use from from industry scoring matrix, but we measure it and we decide, you know, where we are on certain levels and you know, have we hit certain uh, requirements in order to achieve that maturity. But to your point too, and I uh, I think it is a good one. I think it does uh, will make people feel better to have that also externally validated yeah, as we go. Good. So that it's not just what we think according to the to the metrics, but what has been independently validated as well. So that is a good point. Next. Well, risk is one of those where you're always proud that you're managing it well, but you say that very quietly <laughs> because uh, you're never really ahead of the risk management team. So <clears throat> correct. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, and just in terms of emerging risks, so one of the things that we're always trying to do, aside from the top ten that we identify. Um, as those major focus areas, we look for new emerging risks uh, as they as they come to uh, to light. Um, and those that we've all spoken about, but they're on our radar screen. Uh, the supply chain risks, of course, uh, things that we talked earlier this morning. The physical security. Um, how do we do from a supply chain SSM standpoint? Help in uh, ensuring re response and recovery to uh, events and things of that nature. Project risk we talked about has become a new focus in terms of making sure that there aren't unforeseen risks in projects or, or achieving either the goal of completing or managing within budget or on time. So there's a focus on that. The geopolitical is still there, obviously, Russia, Ukraine, uh, China, Taiwan is certainly a major issue. Um, we've got balloons now coming over. <laughs> We're going to have our drones go out and <laughs> monitor any balloons that we see. Maybe they'll get into some a little star Wars yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but should, I mean again these are issues that should be uh top of mind in, in terms of what impacts that could be down the road obviously the 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 inflation recession concerns uh you know we are looking at a higher probability of a recession you know based on the um leading economists question is is it a hard landing soft landing how long will it last uh, you know on the other flip side of it we have very low unemployment rates. And we had a major job print last week, over 500,000 jobs and 3.4% unemployment rates. So 
we talk about a recession, I mean, technically it's two quarters of GDP, negative GDP, but is our economy resilient enough to not have it be uh, disruptive and hard? So that all remains to be seen, but we need to monitor it. And the debt ceiling is certainly, I would say a tail risk. I mean, we all kind of think at the end of the day, like some of these Amtrak strikes or other things we look at, well, you'll be a lot of noise and at the end of the day, they'll all do the right thing and it'll, it'll happen. But you always have to think about what, what if that doesn't happen? Somehow it goes off the rails and we have an issue, need to keep that top of mind as well. And in terms of emerging disruptive technologies, artificial intelligence is certainly out there in the world. It's got a lot of great promise and a lot of great opportunities, but it also has risks. Uh, could that be the next insider threat or you know, other things that it could emerge? I mean, recently there was a, was it the chat AGT that completed a Stanford admissions exam? And then they had to come out with some other app to say, you can use this to figure out if it was done by AI or not, right? So these things are happening faster than people can identify what the unforeseen consequences are. Some, so, something we, we just- We don't know if you're real, Adam. I mean, yeah. exactly. you know, a robot out there. <laughs> Who has so, responsibility within the organization for determining the applications and the risks associated with artificial intelligence? So it's within you know, Rob's group as well as cyber and and others, you know, evaluating all of these things as we go. Okay. But we all look at it and it comes through our, our, um, our risk committees. Mm -hmm. So, but, but this is just sort of, you know, what we've identified to keep an eye on. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if it's considered an emerging risk, but it's one that we're talking more about sort of the human capital aspect that lots of companies are grappling with. And how do you think about that over the next year? How people want to work and, you know, moving, you know, moving people well, from remote and right. how do you see that over as a risk for 2023? No, absolutely. I mean, Justin, Joe, all hit on it. Good Something we all it. are talking about every day. So it's not an emerging, it's always right. been a top risk. It's just, what are the threats have changed? So yes, remote um, obviously was one coming out of the pandemic. I think we've been very flexible to be able to respond uh, to that. But how um, does that impact how you work, right? When you've got, you know, half your team's remote and other half not, when you're working in this hybrid environment, what kinds of risks does that create both in your ability to operate as well as manage people? So. Yeah, and it's just something that we do monitor and we try to find out, you know, again, how do we improve our programs over time? But the, I think the balance of having people get together on a regular basis in person is good for many reasons, as well as the ability to be remote, to get more productivity. You know, if you take some of the people we've had, you know, commute anywhere from an hour to hour and a half every day, some from Long Island, what have you, I mean, that's three hours of their time spent commuting that could be productive uh, working. So, you know, it's a balance and it is a competitive issue for us because there are people that are saying 100% remote or other areas we're saying, five days in the office, well, that's leading to an exodus from those companies to areas that have more flexibility. So it's become almost like compensation as a competitive item that people are almost valuing as, as greater, if not more in some cases than compensation. As but even, long as you're seeing the increase in productivity, and I don't yes. know whether that's- No, I think it's, 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 <laughs> it's working very well. Um, and we do look at you know, all other issues, you know, where are we losing people? Where do we need to gain? Um, Karina's working on a lot of strategies around that, uh, what things we can do to ensure that we have, uh, we're, we're able to compete for, for new talent and retain existing talent. Um, on the supply there... chain side, I, I guess I'm uh, disappointed. Uh, you're a little more negative than I would have hoped there, Adam. Uh, I think from a consumer standpoint, a lot of the kinks in the supply chains are being worked out. Uh, you don't see uh, improvement or you don't see that as a, a trend that's uh, uh, moving in a better direction and that continues to haunt us in a meaningful way? It's, it's still out there as a high risk. It's getting better in, in many areas. So we've seen that easing up as well as we've seen up the ease of, uh, of, of pricing, but in areas like the transformers where there is uh, you know, there are shortages and difficulties, um, everybody trying to get ahead of, uh, of the supply chains by, by ordering in advance and trying to get ahead of each other creates competition uh, around that. Um, you know, any 
escalation so in China. Still exceeds supply. Yes. In a lot of oh, ab ab absolutely. And then uh, you know, in the in the uh, in the renewable space, solar panels still very very difficult to achieve. It slowed down many many solar projects, so that still remains um, an issue. Uh, and in our space too, in terms of renewables, you know, now with the IRA, as we spoke about, or other money that's out there, the requirements for local sourcing of, of products um, is going to create new competition, you know, for, for those products as well, um, because everybody's going to be trying to get those in order to qualify for the, for the tax uh, credit. So, you know, every time there's another change, it could at least to a, a new problem. So always something that we're we're looking at and trying to maneuver around and be ahead of the game on. And uh, some Irina, we were talking uh, earlier um, in terms of just the hydro flow flows and the importance of hydro to us um, and climate impacts and uh, dry winters and all the rest of that talk for a couple minutes <clears throat> where we are with all that. As Justin reminded us, it takes a couple of years. I mean, it's not against it. The waters don't get turned off, but where are we relative to hydro flows and you, you know our view of that? Yeah, it, it, it is a major risk for us because we don't absolutely control it. So we're looking at ways to uh, potentially insure against it financially. One of the things we're looking to do in the captive is to develop a custom project uh, product around providing financial insurance, but in terms of the physical water flow, um, we're actually in the process of building a new hydro model because there are new complexities, not only from the hydro flow, but towards, uh, in terms of what actually gets generated once you have it. But you know, looking at the Great Lakes, yes, it takes a while and a few years out. Um, we base our information on the Army Corps of Engineers, and then that feeds into our model. And um, again, there are other factors that have to go into that, and then things can happen in uh, more real time that could cause some shift there. So as I mentioned in the financial presentation, I mean, a half a terawatt difference is uh, $20 million in revenue to us. So something we have to keep um, a real eye on. But uh, as we also are looking out into the future, one of the things we've discussed um, with the risk and sustainability group is, is and, and building off a, a climate, climate risk study is, is doing exactly that, working with EPRI, Argonne, um, other entities to look at the Great Lakes and look at what climate change down the road, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, what do they think is going to happen in the Great Lakes and how is that going to ultimately Five impact years. us? Yeah, <laughs> but really looking for <laughs> future out. So, yeah, well, that's what I'm so it's, a, it's a huge, right, huge existential risk for the authority. So it's something that has to be, you know, uh, looked at all the time. And then, of course, you know, once it does come in, as I mentioned before, it used to be whatever came in, we generate. Right now, with all the renewables coming in, and they're getting paid just to produce, we've seen instances where there's negative pricing in the market where we're getting shut out. So now we have this uh, competition from the renewables that we have to keep our eye on, as well as other things that can happen. Um, ice, you know, uh, conditions, which we've been fortunate this year, knock on wood, not to have but that's also another variable. So all of these things have to be looked at in tandem. Okay, next. So just a little bit about the commodity prices. So, you know, not only has it gone up, but it's also starting to come down, but it's also volatile and based on events. So you, we have to manage that volatility, but really wanted to point out here is we are seeing softening, but um, from the point <clears throat> in which we set our budget, we were there. Um, at the green, and then here we are today at, at the at the orange. Uh, we do see that maybe tightening up over the next several months, but that is not only a function of supply of supply and other forces in the market, but also because we had a very unusually warm uh, January. Um, if we go to the next slide. So you're already putting your stake in the ground for plan the planning? Yes. So. <laughs> But we'll we'll pivot, and we'll make sure we make our plan. We always we we always seem to figure out how to do that. So, um, but also just not only in terms of what's happened in price, but in terms of heating degree days, just to give you a sense of where we are compared to the past. You know, it's had uh, a, a significant impact. So it's a double 
on the overall portfolio, uh, hydro aside, even in our CNE assets, you know, it's, a, it's sort of a double hit. So not only are prices lower, but when you have less heating degree days, your plants are called on far less. So many of our plants were not as active. Define a heating degree day. Um, now you're getting, I mean, it's basically the measurement of, you know, how cold it is in terms of how much you would be required to produce. So that's really a sort of a, a, a cold weather measurement that we use to decide how much, at what point you'd have to generate X because demand would actually come up based on that temperature. Um, I would I defer to more experts like uh, Joe and- I couldn't, uh, I couldn't figure it out when I looked at this, but-, uh, but that's a, It's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a essentially the area, it's a, it's, a time, it's a time scale with the amount of, of, of temperature you would need to heat. Uh, so at cold weather, you have heating degree days and in, in summer you have cooling degree days. Uh, so it's basically a time average area under like how much energy you need to do. Is it colder than normal year? 22 was. But it, would, it would take more. In January 22, it took more oh, um, this is the temperature. Month of January, yeah. I'm yes. Sorry. Okay. Trying to figure out how we got to 1330. Okay, whatever. Forget it. I'm too into the weeds. All right. Right. So, so the, the so higher the degree days is, is the more generation you're going to need to produce January power. This year, so, yeah. so the demand as a result is lower yeah. because you had the warmer weather. So like Joe was saying, how much how much energy do you need to get to you know bring a, 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 a 30 degrees up to 68 or 69, wherever you set your temperature? You know, what's required to do that versus if you're at 50 degrees, how much is going to be required to bring you to 68? I mean, as simple as I can try to make it. So you're still hedging your planning process with this presentation. Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> Setting the stage. <laughs> because we're you know right out of the gates we had we got hit you know right yeah, 30 days in. we stepped on a rake um next right again uh and this is a follow-up on um the trustee mckibben's question from last time but we did give you some overview of the accomplishments the ssm group last year but wanted to put in a context of how they did as compared to the prior year so you could see the improvements so when we said how many events we've had for supplier diversity, um, major increase there, double the events. Our spend was increased year over year and the breakdown of how it breaks out, MWBE, small business, um, uh, the service disabled veterans organizations, and um, how many events we, we held through our Ariba um, procurements and um, the supplier diversity programs launched. And as uh, again, it was mentioned earlier, SSM, uh, John Canale's group are working very closely with Larry Mallory and Joe Kessler in terms of making sure that um, from our procurement side that we are well equipped to respond to not only supply chain disruptions, but this whole issue of, of recovery or what happens if. So um, working tandem with them has been very um, helpful all around. And the next time when we wrap up 2023, we're going to see in this chart the increase in the number of supply diverse suppliers that we actually yes. awarded. Yes. Not adding, right? Exactly. <laughs> Not educating them on the right. process, but actually getting awards. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and one and, KPI for 2023. And I don't know if we mentioned it last time, but one of the things that did come out of the governor's state of the state um, was a recognition that we need to do more and expand the poll. And you know you you wonder why this didn't happen before, but she's encouraging an initiative to provide uh, reciprocity. So in other words, if you're a New York, if you you know if you're a New York State entity, and you look and somebody comes to you and says, well, we're certified by New York City and went through their certification process, instead of saying, well, you need to go to the state and get certified, then come back to me, we would accept theirs as being good enough for us to use. Yeah. So that's going to be. Uh, very, I think, a game changer in, in expanding the pool and making it easier for people to compete. Great. Uh, next. And just as a look ahead in terms of uh, goals for, the, for my organization, my uh, area, you know, long-term strategic financial planning, you know, we put in a capital capacity model and with a 10-year lookout and to see, you know, 
Do we have the resources? Do we have to make adjustments? Um, are there alternative ways of getting projects done? Will there be public-private partnerships, uh, innovative ways of financing other things that can enable us to do more to support the Vision 2030? Um, we have a financial management digitization roadmap that we'll be coming back to talk more about, but really automating the financial functions. You know, we're automating our time and attendance system, our forecasting, financial forecasting, uh, some of the areas in the in the budget area, and then just trying to get ourselves what I call business ready for the next version of ERP uh, down the road, which will eventually have to be replaced because of end of life issues. But again, trying to get more of the normal work that is done to be automated so that we can spend less time producing things and more time analyzing and being a, a business partner to all the areas of the organization in a more productive way and doing more analytics and, and uh, decision support um, and enhancing our enterprise risk management business controls. Again, as I mentioned before, with internal audit, our business controls group and risk working more uh, collaboratively together and also adopting more of a what I call a SOX light environment. We'll start with the financial reporting area and adopt more of a SOX looking type of process there. And, um, and just also just, you know, uh, staff development, upskilling, making sure that people get continually trained up for the new skills that'll be needed as we automate and as we bring in these new uh, tools and systems and uh, just building our resilience uh, in terms of our business continuity planning and things of that nature. So those are the things we'll be concentrating on for the uh, this year. It sounds like I don't need to ask you how uh, January went or how the year's starting. You've already, <laughs> as your word said, stepped on a rake and we're behind plan. <laughs> behind plan, but we yeah, okay. had some we're other offsets. Yeah, got it. That's good. good. All report. right. Okay. Any other questions? Thanks very much. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Adam. Adam, appreciate it. <laughs> um, we can talk some more and figure out, you know, good start so we just get some consistent focus meeting to meeting and uh what the key drivers are for the year what our success success measures will be strategically risk management financially operationally and the like and we can continue to drill deeper from time to time so okay great okay. We'll, yeah we'll keep coming back to you great. Uh, with that great okay. all right uh we've uh in the last couple of weeks uh, including the last couple hours have had uh, a couple of committee meetings, uh, finance and risk a couple of weeks ago, this morning, cyber and physical security, which uh, uh, Michael uh, chaired for us. Michael, the floor is yours to uh, pass along your report. Here today, the uh, uh, the security committee heard from update from NIPA's cybersecurity program and how it was keeping pace with the cyber threat landscape and uh, some of the other new innovations that we're facing and involving the support of NIPA's Vision 2030 and digitization strategies. In addition to it, we also heard about what NIPA's actions have been in response to escalating physical security threats throughout the country in light of some of the attacks on critical infrastructure at remote stations across the country, specifically in North Carolina and Oregon. No you were just taken. on Fox News, didn't I just see you the other day? I was about the balloon. Oh, it was. Okay, oh, okay. I was about the balloon. They, did they burst your balloon too, or no? <laughs> uh, I knew you go, were going there. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, All, right. Yeah. All right. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, I said we had uh, a finance and risk committee meeting. Uh, Tracy, your report, please. Great, great, thanks. Uh, the finance and risk committee met on January 24th, uh, adopted minutes, received two. Um, uh, well, we received three staff reports and adopted uh, adopted two items, uh, which we'll now put before the full uh, trustees for adoptions. At the meeting, uh, we received a consent item for Reimagine the Canals program, the Brockport Pedestrian Bridge Construction Services. Uh, management has since requested some additional time to review uh, the key economic development uh, around this contract that is to connect existing Empire State Trail and village of Brockport. So we will defer consideration of that item um, until the next meeting after we have a, another finance committee meeting and when the management team is ready to put that forward um, more formally. Uh, the items before the trustees for adoption are to recommend that uh, we approve the award of an on-call construction contract for substation construction services to Michaels Power uh, of Mena, Wisconsin, uh, Keyword Power Constructors Company of Omaha, Nebraska, 
Hinkles and McCoy Inc. of Blue Bell, Pennsylvania, and MJ Electric LLC of Houston, Texas, an aggregate amount of $150 million for a 10-year term. We also recommend uh, the trustees approve an on-call contracts for general contractor services at the White Plains office to Deborah Bradley Construction and Management Services, Inc. of Harlem, New York, and Scully Construction, LLC of North, North White Plains, New York, in the aggregate amount of $11 million, which barely exceeds our $10 million limit for a five-year term. Um, and I now ask for a motion to adopt these items. So moved. Second. Dennis, thank you. Second B. Uh, any other comments, discussion? Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion's carried. Thanks very much, uh, Tracy. Uh, next up, we have uh, our consent ag agenda. Hopefully, uh, everyone's had an opportunity to review those items. Uh, unless you have any questions, I ask for a motion. So moved. Michael, Second. Dennis, thank you very much. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried. Before we wrap up the meeting, I know, uh, Justin, you've got uh, a little announcement and some comments you want to share. Yes, yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I wanted to take a moment to uh, recognize Sarah Salati. Um, as you know, Sarah's our EVP and Chief Commercial Officer, and she's been a, an integral part of the discussions around this table over the last four years and a major contributor to our success here at the Power Authority whether it's in uh, raising our customer satisfaction scores or developing new projects and services for customers. Um, so I wanted to um, make you aware of the fact that Sarah is going to be moving on. Um, we're sorry to see her go, but at the same time, we're happy for her and her success and wish her the best in this next phase of her career. And I uh, want to thank you for all your contributions to our success over the last four years and uh, wish you the, the best of luck. Thank you. Yes. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, no, thanks very much, Justin, and thank you very much for trustees. Uh, sorry for the short notice before the board meeting, um, but uh, uh, plenty of time to catch up. And what's great is that uh, you know you always have a professional and good working relationships with people. But now I can get drunk with you, so it's great. Uh, <laughs> get the rest right. of the story. Then. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, but no, um, you know the Power Authority is a very special place. I always say it's the best of the public and private sector combined. I genuinely believe that, and I came here because of the mission of the organization and the vision it had. And I, I, uh, I uh, hopefully leave behind a, a very strong leadership team who can continue to move it forward and improve it, you know, with the, under the helm of, of Joe's uh, leadership and, uh, and look forward to continuing to support the clean energy transition elsewhere. Well, I can only uh, reinforce Justin's comments on behalf of the board. Uh, thank you for uh, some terrific service over the last four years. Um, I think the ultimate compliment for anyone is you've, you're leaving us better than uh, you found us. Uh, so thank you very, very much uh, for all of that. And obviously, we wish you uh, every success in the future and look forward to, well, I don't know about getting drunk with you, but at least <laughs> share, sharing a cocktail. Okay. Thank you. Again, uh, congrats. All right. Thanks. All right. Our, uh, unless there's anything else to come before us, uh, our next meeting is uh, March 28th, a short six, seven weeks uh, from now when. Uh, Punxsutawney Phil assures us uh, spring <laughs> spring will have arrived. Uh, so if I could, I'll ask for a motion to adjourn. Michael, okay. thank you. Dennis, uh, well done. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried. Have a great day, everyone. Uh, appreciate your time and attention today.